So in this installment, I'm going to be answering some questions posed to me by Andrus Lux, a.k.a. Gabriel Pear, a friend of mine in Australia, uh, and a great seeker of truth as well. Um, again, somebody who has pushed the limits of reality as far as he can and come back with the scars to prove it. Uh, someone who is forcing himself to heal uh, in spite of entropy and universal odds against such. Uh, I consider him a good friend, but uh, I'll get to his questions now. And as with last installment, these answers are pre-written, so I'll just be reciting them. <clears throat> his first question is, who are you? And my reply is, let me circle back around to you on that one. And the second question is, what defines you? And my reply is, most people throughout history have been conditioned to believe that a person's value is defined by their acts and deeds. If a person is good, their deeds are heroic, altruistic, or whatever the popular idea of good is at that time. Until the 20th century, it was popularly held that the ends justify the means also. So many atrocities were committed in the name of God and spreading his good word. Meanwhile, some have held that our externalizing acts and deeds are motivated by our interior psychologies. So it is not only that we so it is not only what we do, but even what we think that defines us. A tree, they argue, has no choice but to grow. It must grow or it will die. And so it grows. A human, being the most evolved form of animal life on earth, has an essence, a soul, or a psyche. That is, each of us has a self-aware consciousness of our own. And this burdens us with responsibility for our acts and deeds in a way that no tree nor any other animal can be. This, it is reasoned, justifies our species' development of world-ending bombs. His third question is, why? Simply, why? Meaning, why is this what defines you, or why are you defined by the terms that you've just given? Uh, my answer to that question is, when an individual is alone, they have no need for any certain definition of their being. Their essence and their being in itself can merge then and their ego may dissolve, allowing their imagination to wander. However, whenever a person is around other people, this superposition of cognitively dissonant concepts collapses, and they are forced to fit their complete spectrum of being into simple predetermined boxes. The main way this is accomplished is by people giving things and each other names. When someone calls your name, it gives them the imaginary feeling of having power over you. This is called, in magic circles, summoning a servitor. Whenever people are around other people, thus, they are more defined than when they are by themselves. Heidegger called this being for others or docine. 
in truth, everyone's ethics are relative to the conditional situation, real or hypothetical. So everyone will have some liberal beliefs in certain circumstances and hold some conservative beliefs regarding other issues. Nowadays, no man is an island because socialized people fear lone wolves. So his fourth question is, what do you wish to become? My reply is, I just want my ego to dissolve back into oneness with the primary clear light of hyperspace when my body dies. Other than that, it doesn't much matter what I would wish to become, since bodily death is the final outcome. I've never wanted to be any thing anyway, so no job would have ever been enough to hold my interest down. And his fifth question is, how is that different to who you are? Meaning, how is what I wish to become different from who I am? And I answer, I try not to distinguish between who I am now and what I associate with the primary clear light at the font of consciousness. In short, I try to never think about myself, but to always think instead from the point of view of that most high essence of which I am aware, that vantage from the perspective of the primary clear light itself. In effect, I try to think from outside the cosmos, looking downward and inward on it. Modern psychiatrists tend to mistake such a mind state of contented nirvana attained by practice meditation for dissociation or tuning out from the here and now. It is a higher sobriety to be tuned in always to everything. And contrary to the warnings of these psychiatrists, it does not interrupt the cognitive or physical functionality of the individual to do it. Of course, one can easily argue a field of pure energy and the human being you are now are very different. Indeed, they are, but I still tend to define myself, if at all, more on the side of the one than the other. Call it my faith. And this sixth question what do you think about neuro-linguistic programming and its impact slash ethics? My reply is, I think the ethical value of NLP and its social impact are inversely proportional. The bigger it gets as a phenomenon, the worse and more evil it becomes. It may be argued from within the realm of fiction. One person using NLP to swindle another is just an old Jedi mind trick, which is arguably bad enough. But one person using NLP to swindle a whole vast audience is Emperor Palpatine, a.k.a. Darth Sidious, which is obviously meant to be seen as being far worse. Of course, fiction pales by comparison to reality. In truth, such Hitlerian psychological persuasion of the masses, and that by any means necessary, including illegal use of subliminal messaging, and even up to practicing outright magic, well beyond just the use of NLP alone, has been the mission statement of the entire corporate class since Edward Bernays invented advertising and named it propaganda in 1928 AD. What mass media and institutional education indoctrinate us to desire is merely a misdirection, distracting our attention away from those others who flank us and rob us of our freedom to escape. 
thus tricking us into doing work for them, usually in exchange for fake money. Most modern people, almost everyone in the industrialized Almost everyone in the industrially developed nations of Western civilization are debt slaves in this social mechanism. Call this system fascism, extremist capitalism, or Sovietism, extremist socialism. It is a result of competition between free market trade and statism that has been going on since the beginning of the earliest Sumerian Empire unifying multiple city-state polities at least 4,000 years ago. Many would say, without persuasion, where would we be? It is simply one person leading others that has gotten us where we are today. And to this, I would reply, exactly. Again, NLP is just one of those things that I can imagine a world without it in, which I would consider a better world than our own today. Sadly, the reality is NLP is increasingly prominent, ever more persuasive, ever more pervasive, and problematically persuasive in modern society. People have been subjected to a non-stop bombardment of poisons and ads for almost a century by now, and we have grown quite stupid as a result of it. In the type of society we live in, defined by dupes and liars, it is unsafe to trust anyone. This is certainly not an ideal utopia. The seventh question is, how has language been weaponized? And has it always been this way? My answer, language, verbal and written communication, is a tool and, like all other tools, will eventually be weaponized by human beings because human beings are innately evil. Let me explain that this way. Everyone is evil to some extent, and some people are more evil than good. Likewise, of the entire population of people alive today, a small but definite percentage of us are totally evil. This is essentially the same as with the so-called Neanderthal genome, all people have about 2% DNA from Neanderthals, but about 2% of all people have a higher ratio of genetics in common with now otherwise extinct Neanderthals. So what is evil? If language is a tool and can be used for good, how can its becoming weaponized for evil ends be avoided? Brian Geisen and William Burroughs first called language a virus, and it is true mimetic propagation spreads like a psychic contagion, passed along from one person to another until everyone is infected by whatever the information is. This, in fact, is the explanation for the popularity of the false idea called God. However, communication is a far more effective tool for distributing intelligence than even an epidemic disease is at its similar task, distributing biological plague. If depopulation by dispersion of disease were any more effective than word of mouth is at dispensing remedies, there'd be none of us here. His eighth question, is most magic sonic in nature? And my answer is no. His ninth question, what are your thoughts on ritual magic?
His ninth question. What are your thoughts on ritual magic? First, we should distinguish between... My reply is, first, we should distinguish between ritual magic proper and simple routine, which some consider a ritualistic, compulsive form of household magic. Intentionally habitual repetition yields clairvoyance that can be honed for accuracy. But practicing traditional ritual magic is slightly more involved than Crowley's slogan, every act is a magical act, might imply. Crowley specified every act as magic because he identified magic with the will, and he reckoned, one canst not but do what thou wilt. Of course, magic is often associated with trickery, such as the will of the individual getting duped into indentured service to any higher power. So if magic includes routine, but is not excluded to it, what more is there? If magic is merely trickery, why do magi practice it when they are alone? Traditional ritual magic involves drawing a circle, and sometimes a triangle just outside of it, and sitting down inside this circle until one begins to hallucinate, usually by attempting to creatively visualize a non-corporeal intelligence into the triangle of summoning. Once, if one can convince themselves this hallucination is real, they may interact with it, command its obedience in the name of God, and make pacts with it to accomplish certain goals you set for it. <clears throat> this technique produces mixed results. Sometimes it accomplishes the user's goals, but it almost always drives the practitioner insane. Usually, the more effective their art, the more insane they will seem compared to polite society. So, most ritual magicians are social outcasts and oftentimes solitary practitioners. There are clubs that practice certain types of ritual magic, such as Freemasonry, the OTO, etc., but these all cost the magician the certainty in their personal willpower and the actual physiologic and the actual psychological efficacy of magic that comes from solitary craft. Solitary magic, likewise, may be done in public. That is, it may be that an individual is in the altered mind state one enters when doing ritual magic while in a group of other people who themselves may or may not be on the same trip as the individual ritual magician. This is extremely dangerous, not for the life of the magician themselves, nor for the safety of the other people around, but for the continuum of the cosmos itself. The ultimate goal of ritual magic is manifestation, the materialization of an object out of thin air or from the ether, etc. And manifestation is a definite bypassing of, otherwise strictly chronological, cause and effect, if not also a direct violation of the universal law of entropy. Insofar as ritual magic does work to yield otherwise impossible results, it risks ripping apart the fabric of reality itself by doing so. Most modern ritual practitioners, most modern ritual magic practitioners do not realize this, and so use this arcane method haphazardly and without regard. This is much the same way as most people alive today knowing how to drive a car 
but far fewer knowing how to tune one's engine so as to reduce its rate of producing pollution. <clears throat> this tenth question. Mind reading slash mind writing. What are they exactly? My reply. Mind reading is pretty straightforward and commonly enough understood. It just means telepathy, at least in one direction only, from the writer who is thinking the thoughts to the reader who is listening in. There is also, however, the reverse of this, which I call mind writing where one person can project their own thoughts onto another's mind and force their proxy to think, read, the mind writer's thoughts as if they were their own. There is also, as an aside, two-way think-talking as well, which is the ideal condition of telepathic communication. People very rarely share this outside of their own pair bonds as mating couples, but telepathic communication as a second nature, form of self-expression, is ubiquitous to us all. For example, consider the micro-gestures one can make while driving in traffic as examples of non-verbal expressions of intention, and one will realize how prevalent such psychic communication really is. An example for non-human animals being able to share this same form of mental-only relationship with one another, even across species, would be riding a horse past a rattlesnake. His 11th question, how does ESP work in your understanding? And I answer, our brains are electrochemical antennae that both receive and broadcast signals through the energy field of 5D hyperspace that underlies the 4D space-time of our local universe. This means that the sub-organs inside our cerebra have evolved for energy in a way similar to that of dolphins, whose frontal lobes have developed a complex array for beaming sonar messages underwater. Directly behind our eyeballs are the parts of the brain called the thalami. There's a left thalamus and a right thalamus, and together they are called the thalami. The role of the thalami is as a kind of holographic projector they receive input-output from all the motor nerves of the body and exchange this for output-input from all the somatosensory nerves in the brain. In short, the thalamus serves as a depot or kind of way station between the body and the brain, or even more acutely, between the pineal and pituitary glands of the endocrine system and the frontal lobes of the cerebrum itself. To provide a massively oversimplified allegory, compare the brain to a movie theater. The pineal and pituitary glands are producing a pulsed signal of light that is then shown through the thalami, the lens, and onto the frontal lobes, the screen. Engrams are small patterns formed out of electrochemical activity in the neurons of the frontal lobes that mimic the shapes a person is thinking of. Telepathy is basically just projecting this same signal outside of one's own skull. His twelfth question. How does one enhance one's own telepathic abilities? Are there any practical tools? 
So I reply, creative visualization as a form of intentionally induced hallucination helps to develop one's skills at mental only signal broadcasting. Imagining engram shapes being beamed from your own brain into that of someone else is a means of understanding how thought transference works. Once one begins to recognize results from such experiments as that, one will also come to the truly horrifying realization that the human brain can also manipulate inanimate objects mentally only. One can think talk to another person, but as in magic, one may also think talk to their own hallucination. And just as this hallucination may, as it often does, prove to merely be a misperception of some real item. <coughs> so one can ultimately think talk to inanimate objects and yield at least the same, if not similar, results as think talking to a human being. This obviously leads toward dangerous territory philosophically, not only ethically, but ontologically as well. And his 13th question, what are the limits of the human mind in Kabbalah? So I answer, there are no limits to the potential of the human mind, except those we impose onto ourselves. The eyes cannot see through walls, but the mind can. The body cannot walk through walls let alone travel astronomical distances instantaneously. But the mind can. Ultimately, an individual mind, being a pattern in the energy field of hyperspace, can even manifest its own biological body, and so can appear and disappear anywhere at will. Likewise, just as the physical laws of 4D space-time have no hold over the energy field of 5D hyperspace, so too do the chronological laws of cause and effect not contain and control the mind in the way they do the body. The primary risk to people whenever attempting to practice mind expansion is in losing their sense of ego or central self-concept. Without this anchor, people become paranoid about being unable to return to their right mind and so become more likely to get lost in the primary clear light that is how the human brain perceives hyperspace. If one chooses to associate their ego with their mind's eye, rather than with their body alone, then one has taken the first step toward mind control over microgravity waves and telekinesis as the goal of all ritual magic, or what is called grossly, mind over matter. His 14th question. In Leary's models, what is the final circuit and what are its attributes? So I answer. In the eight circuit model of consciousness developed by Tim Leary and Robert Anton Wilson following the psychedelic revolution of the 1960s, the eighth and highest circuit was called the neuroatomic circuit and associated with mental perception of reality at the size scale of atoms. 
the components of the elementary molecules on the periodic table. Leary placed this level above that of the seventh circuit, which he called the neurogenetic circuit, responsible for conscious awareness of reality at the level of our own genetic code, as well as the sixth circuit, which he called the neuroelectric circuit, responsible for consciousness at the level of the electrochemistry of our own neurons. I believe he did this because of the order in which these scales of reality were discovered by people, mostly during Leary's own lifetime, not because this is the order these levels actually occur in, in reality. Molecules are the particles of DNA, atoms of molecules, and quanta of atoms, but the quantum of electricity is the electron, which is smaller and faster than the quarks and gluons of the atomic nucleus, let alone than the diameter of an atom itself. So even though people discovered electricity, then genetics, and then atomic physics in this order, this is not the order these occur in as size scales accessible to the mind. Not only would this necessitate rearranging the order of Leary's eight-circuit model, it would certainly imply the addition of another, if not a final, layer to it, a ninth circuit of sub-quantum consciousness. At this level, the mental self becomes aware of 5D hyperspace underlying all reality, and is able to meld with it in such a way that the localized mind and this non-local energy field are understood as being one and the same substance, and any imagined illusory borders between them evaporate. <clears throat> His 15th question. Can you explain what Stan Tenen is talking about? Is there a way to simplify his work for a general audience? And I say, yes. His explanations are already simple enough for a general audience. Consider his model of the Shushan flower. It is based on Buckminster Fuller's model of a truncated cube octahedron shape a version of one of the 16 Archimedean solids or irregular polytopes formed by combining the three basic polygons of two dimensions, the triangle, the square, and the pentagon. The platonic solids are simply the regular polytopes formed by uniform combinations of these shapes, the tetrahedron of triangles, the cube of squares, and the dodecahedron of pentagons, for example. So, in short, Buckminster Fuller discovered certain unique properties of this particular shape, the truncated cube octahedron, and then Stan Tenen took this shape and used it as a lattice-like manifold model he then placed labels onto. This practice is called doing Kabbalah, generally as one can assign any number of related traits or correspondences onto a lattice-like manifold model, such as the tree of life diagram. Instead of the tree of life shape alone, however, Tenen's works expanded to include other shapes for his diagrams as well, such as the Shushan flower model, based on Bucky Fuller's truncated cube octahedron shape. The labels Tenen applied to this Shushan flower model, then, were, continuing to honor Kabbalah as an originally Hebrew tradition, certain letters from passages in the Torah's book of Genesis. So, just like the 4D tesseract lattice of the Tree of Life, the Shushan flower of Tenen and his Maru Foundation is an example of what he called a geometric metaphor of life. 
The Torah, Tenen proves, is replete with such possible patterns in its texts. And this demonstrates what he believed was a preternatural level of intelligent design in the Torah's Hebrew composition. Thus, it was written more than merely by flawed men, but was deeply inspired by a higher cause. And he's not wrong. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of hidden codes peppered throughout the Bible. Most are simply numerical, but many are alphanumeric and require using gematria to find. Even Jesus spoke in parables that concealed multiple possible meanings simultaneously. And even the Greek and Roman authors of the New Testament Gospels were long schooled in number-based encryption systems like Gematria. I even use some of these sort of encryption systems in my own Cheshire Sam novel series to take a cipher message and hide it in plain sight inside the text. The 16th question. What does Kabbalah have to do with memory castles? And I say, the act of doing Kabbalah begins with constructing and maintaining memory castles. A memory castle is just a mental map for storing mnemonic referentials for later recollection. So we could say the ten sephira on the tree of life diagram may be like rooms in such a castle and the 22 paths like hallways between them. Just as the sephira are wrongly associated with the planets and the paths obtusely with the tarot trump cards, so one could imagine a memory castle wherein the hallways are decorated with the trumps and the rooms dressed alike the planets and so forth. The most common attribute of memory castles is a stairway or elevator for burying unpleasant or irrelevant memories beneath pleasant and useful ones although such an imposition of classism into the architectures of the mind is not truly necessary. Likewise, the working tools of the craft of Freemasonry are meant to help the applicant sculpt their memory from a rough into a perfect form of ashlar, a mortarless brick. But insofar as such mental blocks are not necessary in constructing a memory castle or memory palace. All their methods, however ethical and moral, remain merely optional. His 17th question. Do you use any of these systems or methods yourself? And I reply, not anymore. His 18th question is, what is P.O.D.'s religious wing, and what is the religion that they practice? So I reply, the quasi-religion of the P.O.D.'s ideal utopia, governed by Atlantean democracy, is based on a free energy and wireless electricity network replacing the need for a global economic system with the ability to manifest matter out of nothing. In the charter for the first Church Bank of Lemuria, included in the Atlantean constitutions and the POD omnibus document, it rations it out thus. God fulfills an innate human need intangibly, while tangible money serves as best as it can 
to feed humanity's physical needs. As monetary currency becomes increasingly electronic, intangible, and fiat itself, we ultimately witness what Marx predicted as the withering away of the dictatorship of the proletariat. This, being coupled with the mass production of micro-miniaturized technology, is due to the peak in the sunspot cycle that we are experiencing at this point in history. All of these components functioning together as current geopolitical trends tend toward either one of two possible outcomes. Either A, we destroy ourselves with our advanced weapons, or B, we end up developing technology that makes both our current economic system and our ancient belief in theism obsolete. If we end up in a timeline where we pursue the latter course of action, then the Lemurian church bank may be entertained as a means of keeping record of people's use of the free energy and wireless electricity network. This process should, of course, be no less voluntary than a transaction with a bank or praying at any church. However, by keeping accounts for individuals, this establishment could serve as both a church where people go to commune with a higher power and a moral bank where people can publicly keep score of the social use value of their personal deeds. His 19th question. What are some of life's questions that have puzzled you? And my answer is, the female mind, does it even exist? And if so, why does it malfunction the ways it does? So that's the end for this recording. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed tuning in and uh, hopefully I'll see you all next time. Peace.